Hello and welcome to your um, toxicology lecture, our last lecture for the semester. All right, um, so toxicology is the study of adverse effects of chemicals on the body. Uh, there are approximately 24 toxin and drugs that account for about 80% of the emergency department visits. Um, we're going to talk about the uses for um, drug testing and um, some of the useful clinical information when you collect samples for toxicology um, or, for example, the time and date of exposure, whether it's a drug or so when they took the drug or exposure to a chemical, the time and date of the specimen itself. So we know the window between exposure and the testing and the history and uh, some of the medical history of the person and the current medical condition. So what's going on uh, due to that exposure. And toxidromes are um, the specific toxic syndrome created by a drug. So if you think about it like a syndrome, like metabolic syndrome is a, a group of characteristics um, that um, people that have it are, have in common. So for metabolic syndrome, for example, it's a high waist circumference, um, high LDL, low HDL, maybe some high triglycerides, high blood pressure, high glucose, um, excess weight, all of that. So, okay, so that's that's a syndrome. Okay, uh, toxidrome would be the signs and symptoms, if you will, collectively that most people would experience with an exposure uh, to that specific toxin. So um, it could be something like no, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, uh, headache, or it could be skin rashes or something like that. Um, and it, so the, the combination of the signs and symptoms can point to the type of toxin uh, if the toxin was unknown. All right, so um, how do we get exposed to uh, chemicals? So um, there are several things that influence. Uh, so the chemical state of uh, the toxin uh, is going to determine also whether it is toxic or not. Uh, and the exposure route uh, does influence the toxicity. So, uh, for example, um, for the skin, uh, you would be more worried about fat soluble chemicals because water soluble ones would be just repelled by the skin because, um, you know, the skin's got a lot of uh, fat soluble um, molecules there. And so you'd be more prone to having issues with fat soluble chemicals. And um, so uh, also talking about fat soluble chemicals, there are chemicals that are fat soluble that we, uh, if we cannot detoxify, we have to, um, your body ends up hiding them, sequestering them into your fat cells uh, if, if you can't detoxify it. And then actually that can um, lead to weight gain from toxin, uh, toxic exposure over time. Um, and if you, if you think that, well, I mean, who would be, want to put uh, a chemical or toxin or something on your skin, just look at the amount of chemicals that are in body care products and cosmetic products. Um, there's a, a saying around the, the healthcare community and stuff that basically, or the health community, that um, if you followed like the average um, skincare routine, you know, um, of products that are more heavily advertised, let's, let's just keep it at that, um, an average woman would put about 300 different chemicals on their body just in part of the morning routine. So that would be considering, you know, shower, maybe shampoo, conditioner, body lotions, maybe a body spray, uh, deodorant and stuff like that. Plus, you know, the, the makeup cosmetics and all that kind of stuff. And um, so anyway, and one thing that you would uh, you would think everything in there is safe, but the, you, the requirements by the FDA is not to prove that they're safe. It's just to. Um, make sure they're not harmful, at least not immediately harmful. Um, and so it's, yeah, there's a lot of stuff out there that we really don't know what the long-term consequences of chronic daily exposure um, are. And um, with that, we can talk about the GI tract. So if a toxin is ingested, then it can be absorbed. Um, and again, you can look at all the different uh, chemicals and preservatives, especially the dyes and stuff that have been added to um, 
our foods. Um, some of those dyes that are still in our foods, um, especially the red dyes, yellow dyes, blue dyes, all those are actually toxins, um, have been banned in other countries, but they're still in the food system here in the U.S. Um, lungs, uh, of course, if it's inhaled, it can damage the mucosa of the respiratory tract, and that is the fastest route. So inhaling anything is the fastest route to get it into the bloodstream because of the alveoli, you know, you have the capillaries in the alveoli, so that means as soon as it crosses the, the alveoli into the capillaries, bam, right there, it's in the bloodstream, right? Um, and um, so if if the exposure is from inhaling it, then, uh, yeah, it'll get into your system really, really quick. Um, and then injections, so that would be mostly the dr drug of abuse, um, so people purposely injecting uh, drugs that are really toxic for you. Um, into their body, um, I guess, unless somebody forcefully injected a poison into somebody else, and it's usually you're not going to be injecting chemicals into your body. Um, anyway, eyes, uh, any chemical splash or gas can uh, get into the eyes. Um, so here's an interesting one. Um, again, this is from um, one of my health groups. So um, there's this lady... Um, she, you know, with the COVID-19, we've been wearing masks and there's a lot of um, uh, masks that are made with fabric that are reusable that need to be washed. So ideally what you do is you have several of them and you just um, wash them maybe in a washing machine or hand wash them and dry them and stuff like that. And then you just rotate them. Okay. Well, she thought she was going to be smart and she was spraying Lysol on her masks so she's playing Lysol on the mask, and I guess she was, I don't know if she was wearing them right away or even, or, or just later, but the fumes from the Lysol were coming off, I guess, as she was breathing through the mask and were actually going to her eyes, and she's um, now going to be blind because of that, because Lysol is actually really toxic. It's obviously not meant to be on the body or, uh, you know, it's supposed to be used in surfaces like, you know, tables and doorknobs and things like that. But when you spray it, you're also inhaling it. And, you know, I even saw the other, uh, well, it's not the other day, really. It's been quite a few weeks ago. At the beginning of this, people that were jokingly spraying each other with Lysol. This is, it's not funny. Uh, it can really cause harm. So let's talk a little bit about the dose response relationship. So there's a saying that the poison is in the dose, right? And so um, there is a do dose response curve that is set for each chemical and each drug. So the dose response curve is a comparison of the responses over a large range of doses. Um, and there are several designations. So um, TD50 is, think toxic dose 50, is the dose at which 50% of the population will experience a toxic adverse effect from exposure to the drug and or chemical. LD50 is a dose at which 50% of the population will experience a, lethal, uh, experience a lethal dose, so at least lethal dose 50, okay? There are some other terms uh, that you'll see in a dose response relationship curve. There's the um, no, NOEL, basically no uh, effect uh, level, so the level at which there is no effect, and then a uh, low EL, low L, the lowest effect level. Okay, so there's those, there's no effect and lowest effect. And then there's there's no AL, AL, so it's no adverse effect level and then lowest adverse effect level. Those are all uh, different levels that are uh, determined. And uh, so also, how is it determined? Usually it's going to be with animal studies. Uh, it could be also from uh, reports. Uh, if it's a drug, for example, maybe some reports from clinical trials and stuff. Um, they have to try to establish a safe dose with animal testing first um, and then extrapolate it to humans. But then that's why they do safety and clinical trials and stuff like that for drugs. But, uh, I mean, for chemicals, you know, especially chemicals that are toxin, I mean, I, we're not going to be inject, injecting or exposing humans on purpose to these chemicals. That would be, you know, tantamount to what the, the Nazi Germany was doing to people and stuff. So we can't do that, you know, in good conscience. 
So they usually do animal studies, which are also um, have their own problems uh, for you know ethical purposes, but also the fact that um, animals aren't humans and they may respond differently to certain uh, chemicals and stuff like that. So uh, poisons have no well-defined safe level. So there is really no, no safe level of these. Uh, and uh, some chemicals will exhibit bioaccumulation. So, uh, and those have no dose response curve because um, again, you're not really clearing it from your body. And a lot of those are endocrine disruptors. So um, usually the, the place where you exhibit the most bioaccumulation again is going to be in your fat cells and the body does that a lot of times with uh, chemicals it doesn't know what to do with and it can't if it can't clear it from your body so maybe if your detoxification pathways aren't working optimally what it'll do to uh, your body will do to protect you is to go sequester the chemicals into your fat cells and then it won't let go of them and it won't let go of your fat cells or the, the fat in your cells until you have your detoxification pathways back up and running because it would be dangerous to release them um and so um you your job's going to be here in the near pod to go look up uh, something that uh, exhibits bioaccumulation. I will give you one example, for example, that is BPA that's um, been you know, uh, banned from certain plastic, but they've replaced it with, you know, a kind of a close chemical kind of cousins that probably is going to be just as bad as, you know, as we study it. Um, but BPA is in a lot of the thermal receipts and stuff like that that allows it to print thermal receipts and um, it, uh, as you touch and handle the receipt especially if you have sweaty hands or you just put on lotion and stuff it actually absorbs through your skin and goes into your system so if you're in a job where you're handling receipts a lot you could actually exhibit bioaccumulation over days and months and years of working and handling receipts and stuff. BPA mimics um, estrogen so uh, it can give you all the effects that um, estrogen has on the body um, including weight gain <clears throat> and some feminization for the men. All right, so then let's talk about acute and chronic toxicity. So obviously acute toxicity will occur in a short amount of time. So it's usually a single or maybe multiple exposures um, in a short amount of time, which is defined as usually less than 24 hours and the adverse effects uh, occur within 14 days. It doesn't mean that it's going to take that long for the effects to happen. So sometimes the effects can happen like almost immediately. So for example, if you ever clean um, and mix anything that has bleach and ammonia together, that will create a, uh, a very toxic chlorine gas and uh, you will know it right away, and that exposure to your, maybe through breathing it in, is going to be immediate, and you're going to see effects pretty quickly. Um, so uh, chronic toxicity can occur over longer periods of time. So this is where uh, it's, it's you, you don't know basically that you're being exposed because you don't see any adverse effects um, with the daily dose of whatever it is. So um, again, this is um, repeat or continuous exposure. So this could be um, small exposure at a workplace, a small exposure through chemicals that you ingest or put on your body and uh, over a period of time. And so one of the things that we don't you know, probably realize is, uh, you know, in the last hundred or so years, we have put probably about 80 to 100,000 different chemicals on the market. A lot of these chemicals, um, some of them have been banned, but not a lot of them. And even of those that have been banned, some of it is still present in the vegetation and animal populations. So it's actually still showing up in human beings. And um, what we also don't know, so like, let's say um, a manufacturing industry is going to use a certain chemical and they, you know, that specific chemical has been tested and it seems to be safe. Okay. Fine. Whatever. It looks okay. So let's use it. Well, the thing is they, they test them in isolation and now they may test it also as part of the product, <clears throat> but they're not going to test it in relationship to all the other chemicals that are in the, on the market or in other products and stuff like that. And so when um, we, we work and live and use products, uh, whether again, they're personal car care products um, or their cleaning products or their products that you're using around work, 
um, and you, you have this exposure, the the, the matrix of in, you know um, interactions between all the different these different um, chemicals. One is going to be different for everybody because everybody has a different routine, a different lifestyle, and um, probably you know variance in employment and stuff like that. And um, the you know it's almost it's impossible. Like the the combinations are literally infinite of the amount of chemicals and the interactions between the different molecules. Uh, so it's really hard to determine um, if you have a chronic toxicity. It can be hard to determine um, exactly what it is or what interaction it is. Now, sometimes it can be um, pretty obvious. So um, I'll give you a, a quick example, too. A friend of mine had a hip implant and um, at a young age, so in his 30s, he had a degenerative bone disease. <clears throat> and um, they, the, the physician selected a really strong um, uh, I think a um, metal implant thing that had some cobalt in it. Well, um, when he implanted it, he, they, there was already some recalls on the market. And, uh, but he chose to use it anyway because it was a good strong one and my friend was young and all of that. Well, um, over time what happened is implants started leaching cobalt and my friend developed um, cobalt toxicity, started having all kinds of sign, weird signs and symptoms and GI issues some weird food allergies and, and just run down and tired and sick all the time and stuff. And, um, yeah, they finally, um, you know, it took years for them to figure it out. And then there was inflammation and, um, stuff around the, the implant. Anyway, it was a big, it was a big mess and he ended up having to have another surgery to remove that one and put a different one in, but they tested his, blood levels of cobalt and they, they were accumulating to where they were, um, you know, and it was constantly leaching from the implant. So the only solution was to remove the implant. But yeah, he had accumulated quite a bit of cobalt in his body and that's what was causing all his health problems. <clears throat> okay, so um, let's talk a little bit about specimen, specimen collection and handling for toxicology. So um, blood and urine are usually the specimens of choice. Uh, and it just depends on exposure and the detection window. So um, blood, you're looking at hours. So um, if somebody, let's say, just took a drug or took a toxin or just got exposed, you could potentially, you know, and they, they're in the ER now, you could get some blood and do blood levels. Um, and then urine can detect days, up to days later. So um, that can be helpful if maybe the symptoms don't man manifest themselves right away. Uh, and maybe it's been a day or two since the exposure, then a urine sample is going to be more helpful. You can also collect postmortem samples for forensic testing. Uh, so you can actually collect blood and urine from uh, postmortem. And you can also collect eye fluid, stomach fluid, and spinal fluid for testing. Now, uh, when we're talking about uh, collection, uh, if we're looking at drug and drugs of abuse, uh, sometimes you can have problems with adulteration of the specimens. So this is where um, the person that is giving the specimen is one to pass the drug test or is uh, and know, knows that they've been you know taking some drugs uh, and wants to basically fake out the test. And so I'm sure. For those of y'all who have had UA and body fluids, you guys have talked about it, but adulteration of a specimen is de defined as a tampering with or manipulation of a urine specimen with the intention of altering the test results. The use of adulterants can cause false negative results. And uh, so adulteration can be tested by performing a creatinine. Uh, so that's the test for dilution of the urine because the creatinine level should be pretty high in a normal urine. You can also check the pH, uh, the specific gravity, and there's also a test for adulteration substances. Uh, and so this is, uh, for example, a little color chart with the different types of tests that can be done. You can look um, them up online. There are quite a few. Um, you can also look up online what is sold to adulterate uh, urines and stuff. Um, so usually the best work around um, that is one is a um, supervised collection. And uh, that is literally, especially if, if uh, it's really important that uh, the specimen is accurate, it's one of those where you, you are watching the person collect the sample. Open door or no bathroom stall uh, doors and stuff like that. Like, let's 
yeah, pretty invasive of a person's privacy, but it's, um, you know, to ensure um, accuracy. And then uh, the, the specimen um, cup should have a temperature strip and the specimen should be pretty close to body temperature. Okay. So um, screening and confirmation of drugs of abuse uh, for the urine. So DAU is drugs of abuse in the urine. Um, so there's uh, a lot of um, drug testing that's performed at hospitals. And usually that uh, testing will include a statement such as results are to be used for medical purposes only or presumptive positive. Um, because the, the ones used in the hospitals are immunoassays, so we're actually just, uh, for the medical reasons, we're just using the screening test. They're the easily automated ones uh, that we can do and crank out and get results really quickly. Um, and they're really reliable for uh, medical reasons. Um, and, but now, if you need a confirmation test, it is a GCMS test, and it is sent out. So um, if, for example, the test is done for legal purposes, and we're going to talk about that, then they may do the screening, but they will always do the GCMS if it's going to be for legal purposes. Uh, and then, um, again, you would only do the GCMS um, in a medical case if there was really a, a pro uh, propelling need, whatever, to, to have a confirmation uh, for the care of the patient. Uh, the osmolar, osmolar gap, uh, if you remember, is uh, the calculation between the um, measured and um, the difference between the measured and calculated osmolality. Um, to uh, and what that will do is it will re reveal um, the um, indir indirect evidence of the presence of an abnormal solute. So if they they took something, for example, antifreeze is a really good example of that, or something like methanol that is not ethanol, because we can test for ethanol, but we can't test for methanol. We don't have a test for antifreeze. So if they've taken that poison, ingested it and stuff like that, one of the ways to detect it is to uh, do the uh, osmolal gap. So you would get a serum um, specimen and you would uh, run the calculation. So you'd run your B, you run creatinine and all that. So you run your chemistries and then you would run your osmolality and uh, you would get the calculated difference between the two, and um, there would be a big difference between the two numbers. Well, the bigger the difference, the more of the abnormal solute that's present. Uh, you can also do neonatal drug testing, and that is often performed on a meconium sample. The meconium is the first bowel movement of the baby, and uh, so um, sometimes that can't be obtained, and if that can't be obtained, um, they can get a urine sample on a little baby for drug testing. And uh, if the um, testing has to be done for legal purposes, uh, and again, usually the it will be a GCMS type test, even though, I mean, we do the, we can do the immunoassay, but you'll always follow up with GCMS. So um, the chain of custody is a process that must be followed for evidence to be legally defensible or acceptable to courts and government agencies. So. Um, the per people that collect and handle the specimens have to be neutral parties uh, that have no personal interest in the test results. So you cannot be related to the person being tested. You can't be friends with them or anything like that. If that's the case, you got to go find somebody else to handle it because it could be called into question. Um, and uh, the, the purpose of the chain of custody is to maintain control and accountability of the specimen throughout the entire process. So usually what happens is... So the collection is witnessed, and then the the donor, the, the person that um, peed in the cup, if you will, uh, will sign the thing saying, okay, uh, yes, this is my specimen. This is the date and time I collected it, or whatever I, I gave it. And, and the person that witnessed the collection and that's processing the specimen will sign next to them saying, received by, you know, Jackie Smith, Tech, whatever, specimen processor at this, this, and this time. They will process it. It'll be permanently sealed with uh, usually, so you put it in and then you put the seal over the, the lid and into the, uh, over the sides of the cup so that if anybody opens it, it breaks the seal. Um, and usually the patient has to sign the seal. And so you, everybody signs all of that off. Uh, and then the forms and the specimen containers and all of that are all put together in one bag and they are 
put in a fridge or something. Then when a specimen uh, carrier, uh, the person that's going to deliver it to the reference lab picks it up, they have to sign a form picked up by courier, Josie, whatever, whatever, and um, they sign off. When they uh, take it to their reference lab, then whoever receives it in has to sign off on it. Then the person that gets it to testing, they have to sign off on it. The patient the results, the results, put the results in. So, so that you can track everybody that has interacted with that specimen all the way through from collection to the resulting of, um, to the testing, to the resulting of the, um, well, putting the results into the system and stuff. And, uh, and those are legal documents. And if you um, put your name on a chain of custody form, you have to know that you could be called into court to testify. Okay, so let's look at a case. Um, so Carl was found unconscious outside of his home on a snowy day. He was brought to the ER. Uh, labs were run. His chemistries and ABGs were normal, except in the ABGs, there was a carboxyhemoglobin level of 20%. So what do you think happened to him and how is it uh, lethal? So um, obviously what was revealed is carboxyhemoglobin. Um, so I want you to think about how he could be exposed to carboxyhemoglobin and go back and review uh, why carboxyhemoglobin is lethal. We're going to talk about it here in a few slides. All right. Conditions that are caused by polyurons. So polyurons are substances that are in air or water, and they're often from modern life or industrial processes. Um, and um, with the polyurons, you could have short-term acute effects or long-term chronic effects, depending on the type of exposure. Um, and now if you're thinking about the contaminated air and all of that, that would be more likely to be a um, long-term chronic effect uh, just from living in a city. Uh, a short-term acute effect would be if you um, maybe drink some water that was contaminated, uh, that was polluted and stuff, and you only did it once, but it, you drink enough that it made you sick. Um, so again, um, some that I would say usually are more of a long-term chronic effects are smog. So that's the pollution from cars and uh, such things in um, in the cities. And it's not, I mean, it's not just cars, but uh, heating and all kinds of other things. Um, um, secondhand smoke is another big one that uh, can give long-term chronic effects. So even if you're not a smoker, but you live, live with one, you can have negative effects from it. Obviously, cigarette smoke, if you are a smoker, that's uh, incredibly harmful for your health. And then uh, radiation. Uh, and again, radiation, um, if it's um, short-term, it could be, um, so um, a an exposure, accidental exposure, um, get too close to a radiation source and stuff like that. If it's long term, it could be emitting from certain towers or um, electrical plants and stuff like that. So um, anyway, so those are all um, technically polyurents, right, that we could potentially be exposed to. But now let's look at specific toxic agents. So um, methanol is also known as wood alcohol. So where would, might we find some methanol other than simply wood alcohol? Uh, moonshine is one place that if the moonshine is not done properly, it is possible that within the ethanol of the moonshine, there's also some methanol. So, uh, and so then it wouldn't be very easily detectable by taste. Um, and the, what's scary is a toxic dose can be as little as four milliliters. That is not a lot. Uh, especially if you think of a jar of moonshine that maybe had 200 mils in there, it would be very easily for four mils of that to be uh, methanol and the person never know it. And so that can, it can be toxic that way. Um, so the two ways you can detect uh, methanol, if you suspect methanol poisoning um, on a patient, is the ser serum osmolality. So again, the that calculated gap between measured and calculate the gap between measured and calculated um, osmolality, and then GCMS. Uh, so that would have to be sent out. So uh, the serum osmolality um, measurements would um, give you a quicker answer because those can be done by most uh, regular clinical labs. The GCMS is sent out, so it'll take a, a few days. Um, 
Once methanol ingestion is confirmed, the patients are given ethanol or uh, formipazole uh, to inhibit the metabolism of methanol into formic acid and lactic acid. So this is a case where, so methanol is poison, but the it's metabolized to also poison. Um, and the problem with the metabolites uh, is that they're both acids and they can uh, lead to metabolic acidosis. So um, if the patient's already started metabolizing it, then you may also have to give them some sodium bicarb to <laughs> counteract the metabolic acidosis. Um, and so um, the reason, if you will refer back to the previous lecture on, on uh, therapeutic drug monitoring, uh, we talked about um, liver uh, detoxification of drugs. Uh, most drugs, 95% of them, are the higher the dose, the faster it's metabolized. So they're uh, metabolized in the first order metabolism pathway, whereas uh, ethanol is in a zero order metabolism so that um, the more is ingested, it does not the, uh, speed up the detoxification process. And so it's kind of a steady, there's so many uh, pathways and it is actually um, detoxified by the CYP450 uh, family of enzymes. And um, that is also where um, some of the drugs, you know, can, uh, if you take them with alcohol, the effects can be uh, enhanced because uh, it slows the detoxification of each, each one of them. So this is uh, where a process here with the methanol where we, we just um, take advantage of that. So that if a person has ingested methanol, they may give them some alcohol, some ethanol to saturate those pathways so that the methanol is not metabolized into formic acid and can be then excreted through the urine. So uh, in severe cases, Hemodialysis can be performed to enhance the clearance of the methanol and the formic acid. All right, azopropanol is a disinfectant. It's rubbing alcohol. Um, why would somebody drink that? Usually they have drinking problems and mental problems. And um, that's why sometimes if, um, if you're in the ER and you have a patient that has um, mental issues that might potentially be suicidal or is definitely an addict, um, they will do some stuff like remove all the rubbing alcohol, alcohol pads and stuff like that from the room because these guys can actually open up and suck on alcohol pads. They can try to drink uh, if it's liquid alcohol, rubbing alcohol and stuff like that. And that can be really dangerous. They Acetopropanol is metabolized to acetone, and uh, 250 milliliters of that is lethal, and that's 250 milliliters, not that much. So it's like a, you know, like a coffee cup's worth, something like that. Uh, testing is done, uh, send out, so again, high-performance liquid chromatography in uh, GCMS. <clears throat> Ethylene glycol, this one's an antifreeze. So uh, the metabolites are toxic. Uh, and oxalic acid, which is one of the metabolites, will make calcium oxalate crystals and that they can accumulate in the kidneys quite quickly and cause kidney failure. And there's my little thing. So here's yeah, your calcium oxalate crystals right there. Um, and the ethylene uh, glycol can lead to a profound acidosis. Um, the goal in therapy uh, in ethylene glycol in, uh, is to treat the patient before the acidosis develops. A toxic dose is only 100 grams, which is not much. Now, one of the problems with ethylene glycol is antifreeze, and this is antifreeze that you would put in a car, or also sometimes known as cool, a coolant, um, to keep it from overheating um, and also to keep it from freezing, the water from freezing in the winter. Uh, they can be put in boats and stuff like that. The antifreeze itself is... Um, really sweet. Now, I think they've been uh, messing with a formula to make it not sweet because um, so if it leaked from a car or from a boat, I know like animals can lick it off the ground because it smells sweet and tastes sweet and then it kills them. Um, some people have used it as uh, poison to poison somebody else because uh, it is sweet. So it can be like uh, disguised in a drink, a sweet drink and stuff like that if they're trying to poison somebody. Um, so anyway, um, Ethylene and glycol, um, so if they've ingested that, it's either unintentionally and somebody's trying to poison them or they're trying to commit suicide. That's also totally uh, a possibility. 
All right, formaldehyde. Uh, so it is a known carcinogen. This is the reason uh, you'll see warnings as you go into the lab that there are um, chemicals in here that can cause cancer and to be cautious. Um, we use it extensively in the laboratories in physicians' offices um, when we collect tissue samples for histo or cyto cytology and stuff like that. So um, if you are one of these people and one of the techs that is helping process these specimens or your histo tech or a cyto tech, um, you will have to wear a, a badge uh, that limits you, uh, that limits, that uh, calculates your exposure to formaldehyde. And um, so that's, there's mandatory testing that's required um, so that your exposure to formaldehyde does not exceed acceptable levels. And staff who work directly with formaldehyde have to wear badges that detect the amounts that they are exposed to. These are sent to an outside agency for analysis, very similar to the radiation badges that our x-ray techs have to use. Um, benzene is, uh, comes from crude oil and is found in car exhaust. So that would be part of uh, what makes smog and car pollution and all that toxic. It is a carcinogen uh, and it causes uh, low, at low levels can cause toxicity. Uh, and again, a lot of those you would be uh, more exposed on kind of a steady chronic uh, low dose exposure um, because of, you know, exposure to car exhaust from maybe driving all the time or just being in a city. Xylene uh, is also uh, from petroleum refining. It is a solvent um, and you will see it again in car pollution and in paint fumes. So all of these are toxic. And then carbon monoxide. So uh, it is a silent killer because it does not have any kind of smell um, and it can induce hypoxia. And um, it is dangerous because uh, it has a 200 times greater affinity for hemoglobin than oxygen. So it will displace oxygen and bind to the hemoglobin and then um, it does never unbind. And so um, oxygen cannot bind to hemoglobin. So the person can't get oxygen in their blood and therefore into their body. Uh, so usually the carbon monoxide testing is performed on uh, blood gas analyzers. Most blood gas analyzers can do those. Uh, they have to have a co-oximeter to do it. And um, yeah, that would be carboxyhemoglobin is what detects carbon monoxide. Uh, and that's what our case had. So um, these can be from house fires exposure and all that, but also if you have um, natural gas uh, maybe as a source of heat or, um, you know, maybe for your water heater or your stove or whatever. If you use, um, yeah, if you use natural gas and there's a gas leak, uh, you could be exposed to carbon monoxide. If your, um, you know, burners are burning and, you know, they're bur not burning completely and stuff like that. Uh, so anyway, they can be exposure. So, um, the recommendation for safety is um, every house, if you have natural gas, you should not only have a um, smoke detector in your house, but you should also have a carbon monoxide detector. And so they sell those combo ones. I ha we have one at the house uh, and they'll detect both smoke and carbon monoxide. And so I would definitely have that if you have natural gas in your home. Uh, cyanide. So it is used in pest control. So um, it, again, could be used to poison somebody or, um, you know, kids and babies, sometimes they get into stuff. Um, and so they could accidentally ingest things that um, aren't meant for ingestion. Um, and so, yeah, uh, cyanide is still used um, and still there on the market. Organophosphates are insecticides. Um, and so again, it can be used uh, around the house and yard and stuff like that. Uh, but uh, these can also be sprayed on crops. And uh, so you could get exposure through <clears throat> what you eat. And then um, radon is another one uh, that is uh, home exposure. So especially in new homes um, where there's a lot of uh, new, the new builds with new wood or new furniture and all of that, there's a lot of off gassing from these, um, the manufacturing process of these uh, woods and furniture and stuff like that, um, especially if there's a lot of compressed wood and that kind of stuff. And so 
um, yeah, you are at greater risk from radon exposure um, there through, uh, and also, yeah, I think carpets and stuff like that. Anyway, uh, especially in new homes. So um, household products can be toxic too. Uh, so uh, one, again, bleach, if mixed with ammonia, makes chlorine gas, which is lethal um, and very dangerous. That's why there's a lot of warnings on products that have bleach and or ammonia to not mix. Uh, and so do be, ver be very careful uh, in your cleaning to not mix them to not use them together, to not use one after the other and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, um, but let's say you have not mixed it with ammonia, you're just using straight up bleach and you're diluting it and stuff like that. If you uh, just put it on the rag and you just grab the rag and just wipe, well, you're exposing it through your skin. Um, and then also the gases, so if you spray it on surfaces, you can inhale it. So I would, um, especially if you have sensitive lungs like I do, I would recommend uh, a mask if you're going to use bleach and spray it. And I would recommend gloves so you do not soak it uh, through your skin. So uh, because there are both, uh, both ways you could get exposed and bleach is toxic. All right, paint. Older paints contain lead. We're going to talk about lead here in just a minute. Prior to 1960. Uh, so they're, uh, you know, in a way, it's a yeah, household product. So uh, if a baby is chewing on some, you know, something that's wood, that's old, they could get uh, lead um, if paint chips come off of the wall or uh, the wood in the house and stuff like that. That can all cause, uh, and then the baby ingests those that can cause lead poisoning. Uh, bug repellents. Uh, currently, the bug repellent is DEET. Uh, DEET is neurotoxic, uh, and it can accumulate in the body too. The the one that's been banned is the DTT and or DDT, yeah, that's a DDT. Um, it, but it's actually still present um, in again because it exhibits by accumulation, so it's still present in uh, nature and in animals and in fishes and stuff like that, so that we still get exposure. And it is also used uh, in certain countries especially those that have problems with malaria, they've allowed limited usage uh, because of the malaria problem. So it is still actually being used in the world. And so that actually still causes, uh, you know, exposure even uh, for people that don't live in that area through products that are made and produced in those countries. So um, ammonia is also uh, a toxic household product. You need to protect yourself if you use ammonia. And it's mostly... Uh, contained in window cleaners, especially those that are colored blue, um, if you know what I mean. So again, don't mix those with bleach. Um, but uh, if you, whether you use one or the other, you still need to protect your hands and um, protect yourself from inhaling the vapors. Okay, so let's talk about the toxic metals. So we have uh, aluminum um, is used in antacids that you would actually take and eat. Aluminum has absolutely no role in the body, so it is a toxin. The uh, body has to get rid of it. It is also found in a lot of deodorants, especially um, things that are just normal de deodorants that you buy in the store. Uh, if uh, it's actually so prevalent that to find one that does not have, it has to be marked aluminum free. Most of your natural deod deodorants are going to be aluminum free. Lead. So yeah, lead as found in paint. Um, why is it toxic? It interferes with the synthesis of heme uh, from porphyrin. Uh, so then it will develop to anemia, uh, and so that's one of the signs and symptoms that's observed in lead toxicity is anemia. And young children are particularly prone to lead toxicity, and they can have like behavioral issues and stuff like that. Uh, it can make them just um, like crazy heathen kids that can't behave and run around and scream and they're just it's crazy so it can it can cause problems now also chronic lead toxicity can cause um the their um intelligence to be decreased and stuff um and this is um what was um what's the problem in um, places like flint michigan and other places where um the water has been contaminated and the reason is because the old pipes used to be uh, made with lead and there's still a lot of old pipes in the system and if you use a lot of chlorine to keep the water clean because you're using a contaminated source or a source that's not that clean, then um, the 
the high chlorine content causes the lead to leach from the pipes and get into the water and then people drink the water and then could get you know, lead toxicity. So uh, how do you measure lead by um, AAS, uh, atomic absorption spectroscopy and mass spectroscopy? <coughs> so uh, chromium, there are two forms, <coughs> hexavalent chromium and trivalent chromium. Hexavalent chromium or chromium six plus is toxic. It is used in factories, and so if you live around a factory, it could contaminate uh, contaminate the water in the ground and get into everything. And uh, if you ever seen the movie Erin Brockovich, that is um, a really good movie that talks about um, a person that um, basically took on a big company, a big factory that was dumping hexavalent chromium. Um, into the basically into the water supply, um, well, it was contaminated the water, the water supply and the ground and everything, and um, the kids and um, adults and all that were having all kinds of um, cancers and fertility issues and all of that. Now, trivalent chromium is essential, and trivalent chromium, so chromium three plus, is um, very important in glucose metabolism and can be a supplement that is used by diabetics. So arsenic, arsenic exists in both toxic and non-toxic forms. Uh, it is still found in some insecticides. Uh, so it can be ingested, uh, especially if it's been uh, sprayed on crops and stuff. So um, usually the problem with arsenic is contamination of crops and or water supply from spraying the insecticides. You can get, again, acute or chronic uh, exposure. An acute exposure would be if you got exposed to the insecticide itself, a, a rather big dose of it. Uh, chronic exposure would be if you were drinking, um, for example, water that had uh, some of the insecticide and some of the arsenic uh, contained in it. Again, uh, as another good reason, all of these things that can end up in the water supply is a good reason to uh, filter your water all, always and use a really good one, good water filter. Um, the way you check for arsenic is hair and nail analysis um, because it has an affinity for keratin. And keratin is the protein in your hair and nails that make the hair and nails strong. Beryllium is used in many commercial uses. Uh, it can cause lung inflammation. This would be um, more pertinent to people working in factories um, and where beryllium is used in the manufacturing process. Same thing for cadmium is used in electroplating. Uh, it is also present in tobacco, so um, that would be one of the risks of cigarette smokes. It is toxic to the kidneys. And uh, mercury uh, is used in industry and the old um, silver looking dental fillings are made with mercury. And um, they can actually, every time basically you chew uh, with those uh, types of fillings, they can release mercury. Uh, vapors uh, that become part of your body so you can have mercury toxicity. They accumulate in fishes and shellfishes also. Uh, and so if you eat a lot of fish and shellfish, you can uh, get mercury toxicity. And uh, mercury causes protein denaturation. Uh, and you have to be careful. So if you have a bunch of dental fillings that have the silver dental fillings, uh, so they have the mercury in them, uh, they call mercury amalgam. Um, you would want to find a specialized dentist to remove them because drilling them out would cause the mercury to vaporize and you would cause a basically a big dose exposure and could be uh, detrimental to you. So most clinical labs do not perform metal testing. If you refer back to our chapter uh, last week where you talk about nutrition uh, and metabolism and stuff, um, the, the specimens are usually sent to the reference lab, and we usually use those dark royal blue uh, top tubes, um, and you want to not open it and not expose it to air. It needs to be um, yeah, just whole blood collected, label, and sent uh, according to uh, the you know, reference lab instructions. Okay, drugs of abuse. Um, so let's get into those. Many drugs of abuse have addict addictive potential, which is why they are abused. Um, tolerance is the body's reaction to the drug, and um, this is where 
the because of the way the drug interacts with the body, the body is going to maybe downregulate certain receptors and stuff, and it usually has the effect that um, it takes more and more of a dose to have the same effect. So that's what tolerance is. You will know if somebody has tolerance if they come in asking, for example, for pain medications and stuff, and a dose that would normally knock somebody out barely touches them. That is definitely a big sign that they've developed tolerance. Um, the drugs of abuse can be recreational drugs. Um, so you think about that, things like marijuana, even though marijuana has become uh, legal for medical reasons, um, it still can be abused. Um, and then things like maybe some P PCP, LSD, ecstasy, amphetamines, and all of that. Those are your rec recreational drugs. And then Inner drugs of abuse are also pharmaceutical drugs. So there are pharmaceutical drugs, especially all your painkillers. Um, they have a high potential for abuse, and so they are often part of the drugs of abuse panels and stuff. Uh, and then you have your designer drugs that are modified recreational or pharmaceutical drugs um, that are sold. And they're a little bit harder to test for because the, the formulas keep changing, and it depends on who manufactures them, who makes them. Basically, on the depends on the drug dealer. And... Um, so the designer drugs, uh, a lot of times you may have to do uh, GCMS uh, to figure out, figure out, or some form of mass spectroscopy to figure out what, what it is, what the formula is. Uh, most um, drugs of abuse, though, you can uh, use the immunoassay screen, so the urine drug test screen to pick up, so the most commonly used ones. Uh, but either way, if you need confirmation or if it needs to be done for legal purposes, you can do GCMS for confirmation. Um, again, if the testing is being performed for medical reasons, you usually do not do confirmation. If it's done for legal reasons, you usually want confirmation. Um, and um, the screens, those immunoassay screens, do detect the presence of the drug above the limits of toxicity. And that is enough for the medical purposes of doing um, the urine drug screen. All right, so let's start with the first one, amphetamines. Amphetamines are a class of psychostimulants. They increase your wakefulness and focus, and they decrease fatigue and appetite. So they stay up for days on end, and they don't eat and don't sleep. Uh, you can de develop tolerance, so you need more and more um, to have the same effect. The amphetamines will boost norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin in the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Those short-term risks of amphetamine use are a high blood pressure, and it can also give you a heart attack. The long-term users, um, they can get necrosis of the heart, cardiomyopathy, and psychosis. Um, and then a variant of amphetamine is MDMA, which is ecstasy. Uh, and it's often used in nightclubs, and it increases serotonin, so it makes you feel really good. Uh, the short-term risk of ecstasy is hyperthermia. Uh, amphetamines are part of, of most urine drug tests uh, performed in hospitals. The typical cutoff is 1,000 nanograms per meal, and that's considered a typical level of abuse. Um, some assays will detect only amphetamines, and some will detect both amphetamines and methamphetamines. So uh, there are some amphetamines that are part of um, drugs for ADD and ADHD. And so the methamphetamines are usually those that are, however, illegal and recreationally used. So that's why it might be uh, important to make a distinction between, for example, an Adderall and a meth user. You know, so uh, you, you often need to do the distinction between amphetamines and methamphetamines. Um, so the screens are usually performed for medical reasons and not are rarely sent out for confirmation. The amount of uh, amphetamine from MDMA or ecstasy is, uh, if the amount of amphetamine or ecstasy um, is greater than 1,000 nanograms per mil, it will be de detected on the screen. Uh, but sometimes physicians may request a specific MDMA testing, and that requires GCMS testing. Okay, cocaine. It is a powerfully addictive stimulant. It is used as a local anesthetic and a vasoconstrictor. So think of anything that ends in ain. So lidocaine, benzocaine, all of those. So that um, 
they are used as again lo local anesthetic. Um, they are similar to amphetamines, but the effects are much shorter in duration. It blocks dopamine and norepinephrine reuptake, which makes you feel good for uh, a little while anyway. Um, it can cause acute cardiovascular and cerebrovascular emergencies. So basically it can cause the users to uh, experience heart attacks or strokes. Um, it can pass through the placenta and therefore the ba babies of moms that are addicted to cocaine will be born addicted to cocaine. Um, the co cocaine cutoff is set at 300 nanograms per mil in a urine drug screen. Uh, very rarely is confirmation requested for a hospitalized patient. Um, in cases where it is suspected that a pregnant mother was abusing cocaine, they will test on the, the baby. And again, for as we said, for babies, we use a meconium, which is the first bowel movement uh, after they're born. And um, if um, the no meconium is produced, so as in uh, maybe sometimes they have that bowel movement in utero. So um, if that's not possible to collect the, the meconium, they will just do a urine specimen and there's a way they have, uh, cause you're like, how do you do that on a little baby? There are little baggies that actually like stick tape over their genitals and stuff. And so that when they pee and then you, you put it in their diaper. And so when they pee, it goes into the bag. Um, and so that's uh, an easy way to collect a urine specimen from a baby. Uh, marijuana, so uh, it is the most commonly abused illicit drug. Um, it is still illicit even though it, uh, well not, I mean it's still illicit in most states. I know some states have completely legalized it, um, but um, most states have legalized it for medical uses. Um, hashish is more potent than marijuana. The tetrahydrocannabidiol or THC is the portion um, that is uh, addictive and causes the uh, distorted perception, the impaired coordination, and the problems with memory. Now, the reason this works and the reason this does it is because we do have an endocannabinoid system, and um, the THC binds to the receptors of the endocannabinoid system, but um, normally uh, your endocannabinoids uh, will bind, have an effect, and then unbind, Whereas THC binds and uh, stays bound much, much, much longer than your regular endocannabinoids. Um, CBD works more with your endocannabinoid system without having all the negative effects of THC, which is why its use has exploded. And your endocannabinoid system is involved in a lot of process, like almost major, every major process in your body is influenced by the endocannabinoid system. Uh, Marijuana itself is habit forming, um, and one of the risks, uh, especially for young men, is it could lead to schizophrenia. So there is a correlation between marijuana use and schizophrenia. Um, medical uses of marijuana and um, where you, you have to get a medical card for it would be uh, nausea relief and analgesia. This would be um, one of, of course, um, typical uses would be maybe in cancer patients, but also um, it can be good for seizure control and um, anxiety, PTSD, and stuff like that. So there's various reasons why a person may be able to get a, a medical marijuana card. Um, uh, there is some information on that, by the way, in your folder in uh, this week's uh, lessons. The uh, cutoff of detection in the immunoassay screen is 50 nanograms per mil. Uh, marijuana and its metabolized remain in the system for several days. Um, and for chronic users, they can remain detectable for a month or longer. Uh, and some programs that are testing for marijuana use and stuff like that and drug use will actually do in hair analysis to detect longer spans of use. Um, and, uh, and refusing entry into healthcare programs if the, um, you know, student was positive. And K2, um, is worth men mentioning is synthetic marijuana. So, um, normally you would not expect people to die from using marijuana, but if they're using K2, that is a possibility. So, um, if you ever heard of, um, a death, from uh, marijuana is usually, um, they're usually referring to the K2 synthetic marijuana. That stuff is really dangerous. Um, and so um, there's some information on K2 also in your folder if you, um, that's in there in this week's uh, lesson, if you want to go check it out. 
Um, PCP, also known as angel dust, uh, it is a dissoci dissociative drug, uh, it gives you severe psychological uh, disturbances. It's hallucinogenic and neurotoxic. The effects can vary and can be very unpredictable. Uh, the chronic effects are memory loss, and PCP can be detected by immunoassays. The cutoff is 25 nanograms per meal. Um, where I've seen it often used or often pop up is uh, some people will lace marijuana with PCP because they both have psychological effects. And then we have LSD. Um, it is a potent psychedelic hallucinogen. It produces perceptual distortions. And uh, detection is challenging due to the short window of detection. Um, it is not commonly part of a routine uh, urine drug screen. So if uh, LSD use is suspected, specimens have to be sent to a uh, reference lab. I mean, they'll have to do like a GCMS or something like that. Okay, codeine and morphine. So opiates are used to control pain and codeine is used to reduce cost. So, um, Morphines, uh, morph uh, opiates, which are you know morphine categories and all that, um, have caused major addiction problems. The opiate addiction uh, crisis is definitely growing and claiming a lot of lives. I also have some information about that specifically for Arkansas for opiate use, but it is a problem that's worldwide and it affects uh, our healthcare industry and affects families all over the U.S. because uh, morphine is highly addictive. Uh, the semi-synthetic derivatives of um, morphine include heroin, oxycodone, and oxymorphone. Um, heroin is converted to morphine after uh, crossing the blood-brain barrier. And uh, both, um, they, they're really good at controlling pain. Uh, morphine and heroin can produce withdrawal symptoms. Now, heroin is the form that's used as an illicit drug. Morphine is usually uh, more like prescribed and uh, used with prescription under the, the guidance of, uh, of a doctor and but of course um, can be the the problem with the opiates and stuff is um, pain is such a subjective thing that you could claim to be in pain and not really be in pain and if you have the right doctor they can prescribe you opiates and stuff like that and then for pain management and then what you uh, what patients do is then they sell them and then um They've done a lot of work to try to prevent this and by, by networking all the pharmacies together, but they would do stuff like, like copy the prescription and do a really good job copying it and then try to hit various pharmacies to get multiple, um, you know, fills of the prescription and then selling them on the market as, for as much as, you know, $20 a pill and making lots and lots of money. Um, so, um, the screening for opiates has a cutoff of 300 nanograms per mil. Each opiate has its own cutoff. Heroin, heroin has a cutoff of 380 before the immunoassay will be positive. Other, the other semi-synthetic opiates have varying cu cutoffs, um, and the manufacturer of the assay will provide these cutoffs if you look in the package instructions and stuff. For example, a uh, hydrocodone cutoff is 650, but the uh, hydromorphone one is 1400, and oxycodone is 10,500 nanograms per mil for all of these. Um, we'll look at hydrocodone and hydromorphone here a little bit more in just a minute. So, um, part of it too, and I'm going to mention that uh, now, is that, for example, for opiate testing and for uh, drug screen, so opiates are part of the urine drug screen, screen test. So, um, one of the reasons you a doctor might do drug screens on an opiate user that is in pain is to make sure they are actually taking it and complying with their prescription and stuff like that with their claimed use and not actually diverting it and selling it. Okay, methadone is a synthetic analog of morphine and heroin. It's used an, as an analgesic and it's used to treat opioid dependency. So if you if they are dependent on opioids and trying to get off of the opioids, you can put them on methadone. It reduces the opiate cravings and withdrawal symptoms. It is more active in toxic dough than morphine, and you can also develop tolerance to methadone. So you use methadone to get them off of opiates, but then you have to get them off of methadone. Uh, but it's basically, think of it as a step-down drug. 
Um, so methadone is often part of the 10 panel drug screen performed. Cutoff is 300 nanograms per mil. And of course, uh, a, a reason to test would be to ensure compliance with treatment. Your barbiturates are a class of central nervous system depressants. They're on mild sedatives and anxiolytic, which means they reduce anxiety. Um, they've been largely replaced by your benzodiazepines. Um, an overdose of barbiturates can cause respiratory arrest because it depresses the central nervous system and therefore it can depress breathing. Uh, it is uh, addictive because it enhances GABA signaling, which makes you feel good. Um, and also you develop tolerance, which means that you need more and more to have the same effect. Uh, barbiturates are part of most urine drug screens. The cutoff is 300 nanograms per mil. Um, it does not provide information as to what type of barbiturate, just that it is a barbiturate that's, that's been taking. Uh, but that information can be important because the treatment options are different for the specific barbiturate. So hopefully you know what they've taken, but if not, you may have to uh, do GCMS to isolate the specific uh, barbiturate. Um, so there are a few specific barbiturates that can be tested, such as phenobarbital, um, which is part of your TDM lesson. And phenobarbital can be used for uh, seizure controls and stuff. Uh, and those uh, phenobarbital levels are routinely done, um, and uh, they're, you know, an immunoassay or just um, run on the big chemistry analyzers as usually an immunoassay. Your benzodiazepines are sedatives, hypnotics, and anxiolytics, also anticonvulsants and muscle relaxants. So this is where the big market is. This is your Xanax and your Valium. So there's a huge market for anti-anxiety medications. There are a lot of people that are on this, these types of medications. They are less toxic than the barbiturates. Um, if you combine them with other central nervous system depressants, the toxicity increases. So if you take your Xanax with some wine or some beer, it will increase the toxicity. They um, also create tolerance and dependence. So tolerance, uh, again, is where it takes more and more to have the same effect. Dependence is where you have to have it to even be able to function normally. So um, again, very addictive. Uh, the cutoff for urine benzos is 300 milligrams per uh, nanograms per mil. Sorry, and the screen can identify only identify that a benzo is present. It cannot identify the specific drug. Uh, so again, GCMS would be required for that. Uh, usually, people would have a prescription for those, but again, these also uh, can be diverted and sold. All right, ethanol or alcohol, uh, widely used in abuse. It's legal, so uh, or at least if you're 21, um, and so it can be um, purchased um, quite freely. Uh, it acts as a central nervous system depressant, intoxicant, and a psychoactive substance. Uh, believe it or not, there's actually no safe levels of alcohol, period. Your liver takes, uh, treats all of it like a, a toxin, like, like a toxic that has to be gotten rid of. At levels greater than 400 milligrams per DL, you can get coma and death. Uh, so that's toxic um, intoxication, basically. Uh, and it's a synergistic depressant effect when combined with other depressants. So again, just like I said, again, with the Xanax and uh, any of the other, um, you know, um, pain medications, opiates and all that, if you take them with alcohol, it increases the effect and increases the toxicity. Um, ethanol uh, can cause also fatal alcohol disorder um, in we, for women that are drinking alcohol, that are alcoholics while they're pregnant. So it's very important that uh, if you are pregnant to abstain from alcohol, especially early on, because again, it can very negatively affect the fetus and how the fetal, uh, the fetus actually develops, especially early, in the early stages. Um, we can do legal alcohol testing. Um, this is often required um, in maybe some car wrecks and stuff like that. Um, and so I know they do the breath alcohol test um, on, on roadside and all that, but sometimes, um, you know, a driver could request a legal alcohol test. And so we can do those usually, or oh, the ER can do them. There's, there's ways to get them done. Um, so blood or serum alcohol testing is very common. Uh, most clinical, clinical uh, chemistry analyzers have ethanol testing cap capabilities, and most assays are enzymatic and measure down to about 10 
milligrams per DL. So you cannot, if, um, let's say the level is zero, like they have no alcohol, you cannot report it as zero. You have to, to report it as less than 10, which translates as it's negative there's no alcohol on board. This can be um, important because uh, there are some other medical conditions that can mimic alcohol intoxication, and sometimes it's hard to tell the difference. So uh, if you test for alcohol and it's negative, then you know that it's something else. Uh, hydromorphone, also known as Dilaudid, it is a morphine derivative, used as an analgesic, causes sedation, euphoria, and respiratory depression. So again, it's another op in the opiate category. Um, again, the effects are increased when they're combined with other depressants, such as alcohol, which we just talked about. And uh, to detect hydromorphone or dilaudid, you have to do specific testing. Um, so you have to do GCMS or HPLC or something. Hydrocordone and oxycodone are also synthetic. They're synthetic opioids. They are analgesics, so this, they are part of the uh, opioid crisis. They are commonly used recreationally. So this is um, hydrocodone, also uh, found in Tylenol 3 and stuff. They can, those prescriptions can be diverted and sold. Uh, it causes sedation, euphoria, and respiratory depression. It is also an allergy, so, so it's pain control. Now, uh, the crazy thing is, like, uh, these guys are, it's very easy to get addicted to, and they're heavily prescribed post-surgery. And so, I, um, I, it's, and it's actually crazy because, so my daughter had to have surgery and, um, we did hydrocodone for like 24 to 48 hours, but as her, her pain abated, we just switched to plain old Tylenol because I did not want her to have any kind of problems with this. And, and so we had been, we went for like, I don't know, I think it was a one week checkup or two week checkup or whatever. And I think it was one week. Anyway, we had been off of the hydrocodone for days and days and we were fine with uh, Tylenol and the doctor gave her another prescription for hydrocodone. That, I thought it was crazy. Anyway, we shredded it. We did not use it, but this is how people get addicted. It can take less than a week to get addicted to um, hydrocodone. So I have, uh, I know some other people that got addicted that absolutely did not intend on getting addicted, but because of their situation, they had to take it for two or three weeks, and that's enough to get you hooked. So be very careful with that. Um, the testing methods for hydrocodone, um, for oxycodone, are available on the urine drug screen. There are um, various limits available. Many labs uh, use a cutoff of 100 nanograms per meal. Oxycodone is often used in pain management, and urine tests are performed on patients taking it to ensure compliance. Again. Uh, to make sure that if they ha have pain, they actually are taking a pain medication and not diverting it and selling it. Um, the cutoff for this testing is lower and is usually performed by uh, GCMS. And the last slide is the drug use for sexual assault. Um, they are fast acting col colorless and tasteless. Um, so they can be slipped into drinks and stuff like that, and the person does not even know that they've been dosed. Uh, they lead to impaired judgment, reduced inhibition, sedation, loss of coordination, and amnesia. So the person doesn't know what, usually what happened to them until, you know, and then when they wake up, they have this big hole in their memory. So some of those that can be used are benzodiazepines like rohypnol, also known as flunitrazepam, uh, chloral hydrates, um, sedative hypnotics like Ambien. GHB uh, and PCP. Benzodiazepines and PCP uh, are the only two that can be detected in a routine drug screen. The other drugs require specific testing, such as GCMS, uh, which is often uh, only available from a reference lab. But if a woman believes she has been sexually assaulted using something like GHB or something, then she can go to the ER, of course, have all the workup done, and they can actually get uh, the specimens necessary. Usually, it's usually a urine uh, due to regular drug screen to see what's going on, if PCP or benzos uh, show up, and send the rest off for uh, the GHB and chloral hydrates and stuff like that, and sedative hypnotics. They can specifically test for those. So, uh, and that can be part of her case. So, there you go. That is the end of your lesson, and I hope this was interesting, and you guys have a wonderful rest of your day.